Okay, we are super excited to have you here today. Uh, we are the panel with the Bay Area Impact Challenge finalists, and we'll talk in a minute about what that means. Um, but first, we really want to get to know our audience. It helps the panelists know a little bit about who's in the room. So if you can raise your hand if you live within 1,000 miles of the Moscone Center. Wait, 1,000 was too big. <laughs> 100 miles. <laughs> OK, great. How many came from somewhere outside of the US? Great. How many currently work at a nonprofit? OK, great. We have, looks like, three plus a panelist. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Um, how many volunteer at a nonprofit? Okay, cool. Um, how many people think their team's gonna win the World Cup? Really? <laughs> Shout out your country. What are you guys? America. No? <laughs> Anyone else? Sure. Who? Okay, we don't have enthusiastic. I, I don't even know who's playing. So. Okay. <laughs> Did you know the U.S. lost this morning? I had no yeah. idea. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, my name is Stephanie Hannon, and I'm very proud to be here hosting the discussion with the Bay Area Impact Challenge finalists. If some of you were here this morning, um, you might have heard my intro already. I'm the director of product for a team called Social Impact. And it's a really unique, awesome place to work at, at Google. We get to apply our engineering talent to social and humanitarian problems, like how do you improve democracy? How do you get people engaged with their community? How do you make the nonprofit ecosystem work more efficiently? Um, how do you help keep people safe? And how do you end repressive censorship? So magnitude, incredibly high magnitude of challenges, um, but it's really amazing to be at a company that invests their resources and, and people in this. Um, from the panel this morning, you're gonna see some, from the talk this morning, you're gonna see some themes that carry over into this panel about how you think about scaling your impact as you're a nonprofit, and also how when you try to uh, address underserved communities, they might use technology different than we expect. So the Google Impact Challenge. It's a, a, a challenge that uh, finds and funds the best nonprofits for a country and region that are using technology to create change in our community. We've hosted them in the UK, India, Brazil, and most recently, the Bay Area. In March, we launched one, the Bay Area one here, asking local nonprofits to share their most innovative idea. Over 1,000 applied, and we selected 25 finalists, and we're gonna talk to three of them here today. Across the program, we gave away $5 million. So lots of opportunity for funding here. I'm joined on this panel by these three finalists. The first is Eric. Eric is a co-founding CTO of One Degree, a nonprofit working to revolutionize the way low-income families access social services. He has been a former product manager and engineer at change.org. He's worked for nonprofits for campaigns and fundraising efforts. And he's been programming since he's six years old, he loves dogs, and he has a 15-year-old dog named Berkeley. I made them all give me fun facts. <laughs> fun facts, dogs, if you guys want to talk about that in the Q&A. Susan is the CEO and founder of Hack the Hood, a nonprofit addressing digital equity by training low-income kids to create websites for local small businesses, actively supporting them to launch their tech careers. She's a former tech executive. She was a VP at Netscape and AOL and a senior product director at Yahoo. And her fun fact is that she's an active permaculturist. And it took me a while to learn how to say that. <laughs> permaculturist. OK, Stefan is a founding member of the Technology Advisory Board for Beyond 12, a nonprofit created to increase the number of traditionally underserved students who earn a college degree. He's our international panelist. He's from Sweden. He moved here in 99. He's been leading teams that build software and design systems uh, for 20 years, including at Dell and he's launched several companies himself. His fun fact is that he loves pickled herring. And I can tell you it is terrible, because <laughs> <laughs> I have had it. <laughs> so we're gonna start with an introduction, then I'm gonna ask a few questions, and then we're gonna turn it over to you guys to see what you wanna talk about. So you can always have questions percolating in your mind. So um, to begin with, if you can talk about your organization, the mission, what you're trying to address, and some of what inspired you to work in this area, starting with Eric. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so I'm Eric. I'm the CTO of One Degree. And um, let's start with a little background about something you already probably know about. Uh, it's really easy to find the best burrito in the mission. It's really easy to make a reservation on open table. But low-income families don't have the same sorts of tools to easily and quickly find the services that they need that can help them improve their lives. 
And so, for example, we're building, well, we've built one degree for Angela. And Angela is a low-income teenager living in San Francisco's Outer Sunset neighborhood. And uh, Angela's family is low income. Her parents didn't go to college. Um, and they just don't know uh, where to send her or they don't have any recommendations for her in terms of gaining valuable college experience. So she, Angela used one degree to find a summer program that is specifically geared towards her under-resourced teenagers living in the Bay Area to help them gain college experience or work experience to make them more competitive for college. And so we're helping Angela, but we're also helping uh, lots of families with lots of different sorts of needs in, uh, in health, in housing, in food, in all, all kinds of social services. And the reason it's so difficult to navigate is because the social safety net is because it's, um, there's over 6,000 in the Bay Area, 6,000 nonprofits doing social service work. Um, and just doing a Google search doesn't really work because it just gives you back thousands of links. You don't know what you're eligible for. You don't know what's actually a good fit for you. You don't know actually what each organization does. Um, and then, know. you know, yeah. But search quality is challenging. <laughs> right. And I'm not sure that just improving search quality would even get at the issue. Um, we have online directories of social services, even if you limit it down to a pool of organizations that um, is, is somewhat finite, um, you still are stuck with this issue of, OK, what's what am I eligible for? What, what, what do organizations do? Right? Getting at the heart of that issue is the key. And so with one degree, and so uh, for example, I've illustrated here, uh, nonprofit social work professionals have been using paper binders for generations. And, and in some cases, we put those online. Um, but those are just, those are just basically glorified paper binders online. And so we can do better. And so here's what we've done with one degree. Um, we've created um, a, a website that helps you find really specific, actionable information that we call opportunities. So when you search on one degree, we don't just give you back the organization, we give you back the thing that you can do. So for instance, uh, get job training for adults, or get a free hot meal on Thursday evenings at this location at this time. Um, and then the second thing that we do with One Degree is we help you manage those resources, the, the things that, uh, that, that you think will help you. And so we keep track of those in a list. We send you personalized recommendations. And then we're um, extremely metrics driven and we, we are able to track what's relevant to you and what you, what, you take, uh, what you take action on. And then the final thing we do is share. We share, we help people share the experiences that they have with social services um, so that the community can improve uh, overall, and that other people can know what are the best resources out there and what are the best services uh, that might improve, help them improve their lives as well. And so that, in a nutshell, is what One Degree is, and I look forward to answering questions. I just am really curious about the eligibility thing. You might have said this, but do you work directly with nonprofits to figure that out? Because it's not published in a clear way a lot of times. Yeah, absolutely. So we, um, we do work with a lot of nonprofits, um, and, I, and I can get to that a little bit more in terms of uh, as a way to do outreach to people. But we've taken a really specific approach to um, working with uh, individuals directly. So we do work with nonprofits uh, in some cases to make sure their information is correct in one degree to, to, to really uh, surface and highlight that eligibility information, um, but nonprofits are not necessarily solving the enrollment and intake process is not necessarily where we're starting from. Okay. Maybe one day. Great. Thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. So Susan, tell us about Hack the Hood. Sure. Hi, everybody. I moved to Oakland from Silicon Valley in 2008, and in the past couple of years, the number of tech buses going through the streets picking up people to take them to San Francisco or Mountain View has really risen. And one of the things that I came to realize is that there are a lot of people who live in cities like Oakland who feel like they're never going to be able to get on those buses. They feel very shut out. They don't have the education or the relationships to get them jobs in technology. And they don't really know how to get them. And there's a lot of hopelessness and a lot of frustration. We started Hack the Hood as a program that could work with low-income youth of color in Oakland and cities like it teach them really basic web development skills, search engine optimization, how to list businesses in Google local places, maps and directories. And we take those skills and the kids go out and get local businesses online and help bridge the uh, economic divide by making people who might not show up in a search on a map suddenly appear when you're looking for them on your mobile phone. The kids are doing real world hands-on learning and once they kind of have some of that under their belt, we take them to companies like Google and Facebook and to small startups 
where they can meet people of color who are working in tech careers and understand that there are so many different kinds of jobs that they could train to be qualified for. It's a pretty impactful program, but it's also a very young program. And it's a program that's very much made in partnership. We collaborate with the city of Oakland, who was our first funder. We work with all kinds of chambers of commerce and business improvement districts, neighborhood associations, merchant groups, volunteers block walk to help collect merchant data from people who don't have easy web access. And it's really kind of you know the village trying to come together and uh, change both the prospects for these youth of color, um, real diversity play, but also really help these low-income businesses. So as a winner of the Google Impact Challenge, this is a very exciting time for us, because we now have the capability to expand. And we want to expand into the greater Bay Area, and over the next two years, reach 5,000 youth and as, and as many as 25,000 businesses through our program. So if you're interested in learning more, um, I'd love to talk to you more. Thanks. Susan, you clearly have such a passion for Oakland, but I know you're not a Bay Area native. Can I ask how you made it your home? I'm one of those people who moved to Oakland because I came from Brooklyn. Um, I moved from New York to Silicon Valley to work at AOL Netscape back in 2000, and always thought I would like Oakland, but didn't want to make the commute. And then when I started doing my own startups, I had a tech stars company that crashed. I moved to Oakland because it was cheap, and I thought I would like it. And I kind of fell in love with the city. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Stefan. Yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, it's great being here. Thanks, thanks, everybody, for joining. I know it's late in the day. Um, so by way of introduction, I want to share with you a, a statistic that I think is pretty startling. Uh, when you look at the US today, only 8% of kids from a low-income background can be expected to earn a college degree by their mid-20s. That's in stark contrast to 82% of kids from a higher income background. So if you just think of that gap for a second, like think of the lost potential that that represents, that's the issue that we're trying to solve at Beyond 12, and that's the space that, that we work in. Uh, obviously, graduating or not graduating has a huge impact for <coughs> That's right. Uh, for the students and, and for the student's family. Uh, but. In addition to that impact, it has a tremendous impact on our economy. In California alone, by 2025, if we continue on the current trajectory, we're expected to be 2.3 million degrees short of what our economy is, is expected to need. Right? So there's a tremendous impact not only on a personal level, but for our economy as well. So what Beyond 12 does is that we've uh, created a, a, a set of services and a set of tools that, that we use to try to bridge this gap. Right. Um, and when we look at uh, the data and the service gap that exists, what we find is that we really have a broken system. We have a, an educational pipeline where high schools don't talk to colleges, when we have no way to actually track what's happening to our kids through that pipeline, right? And the impact of that is that our kids are falling through the cracks. The impact is that our kids aren't graduating, as the data clearly tells us. And what we're trying to do is kind of bridge that gap and help high schools and colleges provide the, the academic, the social, the emotional support to these kids to make sure that they're able to actually graduate, right? Um, and fundamentally, so what we do at Beyond 12, we do three things. We track kids. So when kids get into college, we, uh, we track their performance and we feed that data back to high schools. And what that does for the high schools, that allows them to understand how efficiently they're actually preparing kids for college. Uh, what we're seeing today is that we're seeing high schools graduate kids that are college eligible, but not actually college ready, right? So we track kids, we connect kids, we connect kids to, uh, to other students on campus, to important campus resources that's going to help them be successful. Uh, and then last but not least, we coach kids. So for our low-income freshmen, we provide a personal coach for the first two years of college, allowing them the support system that they need to be able to be successful. Uh, we believe, obviously, that this has a tremendous impact and potential for a tremendous impact on, on the kids that we are able to work with directly. But equally as important, we're able to have a systemic impact both on the high schools from which our kids are coming and the colleges that they're enrolling in and that they're currently attending. So in a nutshell, that's Beyond 12. I know you're Bay Area based, but I don't know if your students or users are mostly in the Bay Area, or are you trying to solve this nationally, internationally? 
Yeah, great question. So Beyond 12 is a Bay Area based and founded uh, organization. We do operate on a national level today. So we do, we actually have a minimal office in Atlanta as well, but we're a national organization. So we support kids who come from school systems across the country. Great, thank you. Does anyone know what that clapping is outside? Is it? There's a comedy show next door? <laughs> and you guys chose to be here with us? Yeah, that deserves a round of applause. That's amazing. We're gonna make them jealous. That's what's there you about go. to happen here. Okay, so we are at a developer conference and these people in the room are probably amazing technology, te technologists. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how you're using technology to address your issue and maybe talk about what's unique in your approach, starting with Susan. Sure. Does anybody know teenagers in big cities who don't have smartphones? Everybody who comes into our program has a smartphone, but most of the youth that we work with think of themselves as consumers of technology, not as producers of technology. To them, uh, the kind of apps that we look at every day are kind of a black box, and they're the, they're the audience for it. So part of what we're trying to do is change the equation and teach kids how they can use basic web tools to become producers. So what we start off with is very simple. It's really the Google App Suite and tools like Weebly that are drag and drop um, website builders. But we use that as a gateway to make them feel successful, make them interested in other kinds of programming. So we have a mentor program. We have a lot of local programmers from Oakland and the Bay Area who really want to help our kids understand all the different kinds of programming languages, the different kinds of backend systems you can work with, what APIs are, um, what's, a, what's a code review, you know, and uh, help them kind of get from our program, which is a feeder, into deeper kinds of involvement with other kinds of tech. So we look at ourselves as a great place to start. We want to help move them along the way, whether it's to a certificate in project management or it's actually um, starting to study, you know, a serious programming language and get the skills to work in the industry. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to ask the same question of Eric about one degree. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, there are online directories that exist. Google exists as a as a search engine. Uh, there's also a pretty well known directory called 211. I don't know if anyone here has heard of it. It's basically an online directory of social services. There are other directories out there, um, and they're mostly geared towards social work professionals. I sort of alluded to this in the intro, but. They're geared towards people who already know how to navigate, who know sort of they can see an organization kind of already tell you a little bit about what, what that might be, uh, how that might benefit you. And so what we did with One Degree was take a very unique approach, which, which was to create a, a user-aligned consumer web product um, and eventually smartphone apps uh, for, um, for help seekers themselves, not for the intermediary, not for the caseworker or the social worker. Um, and so that's, that's the big differentiator. And we, the way we do that is, or one of the ways in which we, we get at that is besides just having like very high quality, we hope high quality, engaging experiences, but it's also part of the, the content that we serve. Um, and so I, we sort of saw that in the, um, in the intro slide, but um, it's, uh, we get at that through, instead of showing you information like if you were searching for help with a pregnancy or a pregnancy test, Rather than giving you back the organization St. Anthony Foundation, we would give you back get a pregnancy test, um, and <laughs> and, <sorry. laughs> it's okay. and here's how and here's and here's where to go and here's when to do it. Uh, door, and in this case, what the next steps to take are, and in this case, it would be to go to the clinic during office hours or to during clinic hours. And so we we, we give you really specific information that's geared towards consumers and not yeah. professionals. It's really nice to hear you articulate who you're trying to help so clearly, the mm -hmm. help seeker, mm -hmm. because I think that's something we all struggle with, mm -hmm. is defining the user. Yeah, and absolutely. And that isn't to say that there's not, um, there's not a place at one degree uh, for professionals, nonprofit professionals, and social work professionals, and there absolutely uh, is. And, and in fact, a lot, we have a, a, a large uh, user base of people in local nonprofits using one degree, but it's, and it's hopefully growing, but uh, it's, they're using it as, a, as something um, that they can use along with their clients um, because the content is so ready for their clients. It doesn't need to be translated, it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, it doesn't need to be sort of uh, put into, into layman's terms. Um, it, it's, already, it's already ready for help seekers. Great. And Susan, I, this morning, just whapped my microphone like a thousand times. <laughs> this is what I'm trying not to do it anymore, but it's amazing. Um, Stefan, I'd like to ask you a different question. 
Um, now I can see that I might have screwed that up. <laughs> That's all right. But Eric did a great answer. So yeah. I'm just going to ask you the same question. Can you talk about how you're using technology to address your issue? Sure, yeah. Um, let's stick to the script, right? Uh, so I think. I only have one job so far. <laughs> so good, right? No, I think Eric, Eric did a great job. So um, when we look at, if you think back to our model, one of the key components of our model is the, the coaching model, right? So uh, the, the coats that we provide to our low-income freshmen for the first two years of their college experience. Um, it's a great model. We know that it works. Uh, data tells us that it works. But by definition, it's, not, it's a high-touch model, and so therefore it doesn't scale very well, right? So um, even if we would like to, it's not really realistic for us to try to provide that model or that coach to every kid in the US who might actually need it. So what we're, and the kids that we work with, the, in, by way of background, oftentimes they're the first kids in their family or their circle of friends or sometimes even in their community that go to college. So they don't have that kind of social network and social support, support network and support system that maybe you enjoyed or I enjoyed or you guys in the audience enjoyed. Um, you know, parents who went to college and can prepare you for what that experience is going to be like. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that you need to understand. There's a lot of, uh, there's a stark difference in your, uh, in the academic requirements, academic deadlines, things to think about from kind of uh, the, the skills and, and behaviors that you need to pick up. So it's this big hairy problem. Um, so what, we, what we're doing with, with help from Google is that we're creating the MyCoach app. And what that does, or what we're trying to do with that, is kind of take this big hairy problem and synthesize it down into actionable items, things that uh, students can take action on, deadlines that they can work towards, um, skills that they can acquire, uh, behaviors that they can learn that's going to ultimately allow them to be successful in college. Uh, and by, by doing that, what we're doing is we're essentially creating a, a virtual coach and, per, and are, we're able to provide that proven coaching model to um, a scale of students, right? So a critical mass of students that, that really need it. So super excited about that. And then of course on, on the back end, we're ha we have an analytic system that allows us to track how well those kids are doing compared to the kids who are receiving the, the personal coaching model and also what parts of the application or that experience actually works, what we need to double down on and what we need to you know, maybe jettison on and, and get better at. Great, so, thank you so much. No problem. So Eric, I would love to share some of your learnings with this audience. What are some misconceptions developers might have when they develop for users like yours? It's a great question that we've amply prepared for. Yeah, we just <laughs> uh, thought of that. So, uh, it's, this, so we actually have a lot of misconceptions that we face. Um, and um, one of the, the biggest uh, is, and I'll let you, on, I'll, I'll let you in on like a little bit of a, a secret in the tech industry, which is that uh, poor people use the internet. And we actually have these slides that I've prepared. Um, and you can see that about 50% of low-income families access the internet somewhere. So that's already, that's already um, a, pretty, a pretty high volume of people who we know are in this market. And then we also know that a large percentage of low-income families or low-income individuals have smartphones. So about, I think it's about 47% of of individuals uh, under, 49, uh, under 49 years of age have a smartphone. And then that, that number jumps to 77% when we talk about under 29 years old. So we're talking about a huge market of people who are low income, who have smartphones, who are digital ready, um, and who don't have tech products that are built for them. And so, um, or in this, in this sense. And so I think, um, I think those are, those are two major misconceptions about, about access. Um, another misconception that we face a lot, um, or maybe it's a judgment, is um, is technology really something that a low-income individual should invest in? I mean, if you can't find food, why would you need a smartphone? Um, and I think that's something that we face a lot, and I think we should be really clear here in this room that technology is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Um, it's technology, we use our smartphone, we use the internet to access government services, to apply for jobs, to manage our bank accounts, to pay bills, um, to learn. Um, it's a necessity in today's world. And so I, I think that's, uh, that's another big thing that, that, we, uh, that we face a lot in terms of misconceptions. So how do you apply these learnings as you're developing one degree? Yeah. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yes. Uh, these are great, yeah, these are great questions. Um, uh, I would say um, we take, we take um, 
we, we, we start from a perspective that technology is a really important tool. Um, and we, we want to build first class, um, first class technology, first class, class web experiences, because it's so critical. It's not a nice to have. It's not sort of like a let's build a, a cool user experience for, for user experience sake. Um, it's a necessity because it's already really difficult to find help. It's already really difficult to get the resources that, that some families need. Um, and so it's a requirement that, that we build uh, excellent experiences for them so that um, not only is it because they should be excellent for everybody, right, um, regardless of your income level, um, but also because it, it makes it easier to actually get help. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Stefan, I'd like to ask you about the major pitfalls with regard to technology and social change. I'm sure it's something we can all comment on, but have you experienced it? Yeah, it's, a, it's an important question, right? And I think you know, if you ask everybody in the audience, I'm sure everybody has a different answer. But uh, I think one thing that one thing that I see, or a couple of things that I see often, is is this, particularly with with technology changing so fast, we have a tendency to believe that the new device or the new app or the new solution or the new paradigm, big data, whatever it may be, is going to solve the things that we're struggling with today, right? They're going to affect. Uh, the, 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 they're going to be able to affect the change that we want in, in the social, social arena. And uh, I think by and large that's not really true. To have systemic change, you really need to be able to change uh, human behavior and human practices. And in order to do that, we need to, to kind of bring, bring to the table the, the folks who, who we're trying to solve for, right? So similar to what Eric is doing, right? Really understand what their lives are, are about and really understand how they're using technology or they're using devices or apps, et cetera, and kind of get at their problems through those channels, right? And too often we work around these groups. Too often we're not putting them at the center of, of what we're creating. And we're kind of sit and we congratulate ourselves on how smart we are and how, how nice we are to help all these, all these wonderful people out there who need our help, but we're not bringing them in and we're not putting them at the center of what we're creating. And I think that's super important. And that's the only way that we're gonna be able to get systemic change if they're part of the process, if they have a voice, a strong voice, uh, that allows them to feel like they have agency in what we're creating. So I think those are some of the things that I see as, as challenges with technology affecting social change. I just wanna add that I think that user-centered design is a principle that it's really important to work with with low-income communities and that the best apps and the best tools are developed in partnership with the people that they serve. And we learned some really funny things when we first started working on this project. We were like, well, we can just do everything through our phone and our tablets and computers. And we actually had to use paper. There were people who wanted to fill out a form, and like that's what they were comfortable with. And we ended up saying, well, you know, if that's what a certain segment of our audience wants, I guess we're going to do that. It seemed very archaic, but um, they were much more comfortable filling out a piece of paper than having somebody enter um, information into a tablet. Eric, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just want to add something, um, and this gets to, um, uh, well, I think this, this idea that like, if we build it, they will come, right? This like, phenomenal technology is that we've solved some amazing world problem um, just doesn't, doesn't really happen. And it's, I think we're all, we're all sort of saying the same thing, that mm -hmm. it's this user-aligned approach that's really critical. We're on the ground every day talking to people, uh, recruiting people, and asking them questions, and asking them how we can be helpful, and what, what, what's actually useful to you, what's not. Um, yeah. yeah, I think we're working or struggling with some of the same things at Google. One of our areas is civic engagement. So how do you get people to be interested in the things happening around them on their block, their bike lane, their school, their park? And the data is really hard to get to even try to expose that information um, to users. But then I don't know if they're going to be interested. Like, what if we go to all the trouble and get all that data? And I think there's sometimes a little bit of if we build it, they will come mentality, but mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out aggressively how to test those assumptions. Yep. Sounds like that's a big part of whatever all of us are doing. Um, Susan, I would love it if you could walk us through a particular challenge you've faced at Hack the Hood. Sure. Um, one of the challenges we face at Hack the Hood is just how thin the margin is that a lot of our young people are on financially. We were very proud of the idea that we were building this virtuous circle where we could train kids, the kids work with businesses, and then we would help them get more training and more education. Um, but our first full program was last year, and I had a very sobering moment about January when I discovered that of three of the youth who had enrolled in college who hadn't planned to go, two of them had dropped out. 
Um, one was a girl who got pregnant, and the other dropped out to support a family member who needed help because she was the only person in her family who could get a full-time job. So here was one of the best students in our program, incredibly bright, working as an assistant manager at McDonald's for $8.75 an hour. And I felt like we'd really sort of failed her because we didn't really understand that kind of getting her to college, getting a loan to pay for school wasn't really enough. And it made us really change our program. We kind of stepped back and said, you know, how do we provide better support beyond the actual boot camp that we're doing, not only to get them internships and job placements, but in general? And what we did is we reached out to the community colleges, and now this year, we're going to say things to kids like, wow, you're really good at logistics. You could go to Samuel Merrick College and get a degree in project management. And there are certificate programs that we could get them into where if they are working, they could make $15 or $20 an hour and be able to continue their education. So that was hard to see that um, the safety net was so thin and that we really needed to do a lot more to, to make them successful. Great. Thanks for sharing sure. that story. Eric, do you have a case study that you could share with us? Yeah, I do. One of your um, challenges? Yeah, and this, is, um, this goes back to actually what we were just talking about in terms of user-centered design um, in that, um, so before, you know, this is, the, this is something that every sort of product person faces is, um, is you know, how, uh, before you have anything off the ground, is how complex do you make the minimum viable product? And so before we started, we um, did a, a bunch of user interviews or potential user interviews with people who we thought might be our target audience. So um, I remember really distinctly talking to one mom who really made me <laughs> realize something, which was that a lot of low-income families have, or low-income low individuals who have smartphones, those, that segment that we were talking about earlier, which is quite sizable, um, use smartphones, um, have them and use them on a regular basis, but don't use email. And so that made us realize that to require email for signing up for our service, that, was, that, would, not be, uh, that would be a non-starter for a lot of people. And it was really important to us to be able to serve a wider market and include these people into um, into our, our membership at one degree. So we, um, we decided from the get-go, although it, it definitely adds some complexity to, um, to a site just starting out, uh, we decided to accept registration through, with either email or, or a phone number, and then with those people, we communicate with them over SMS instead of email. Um, and so that, you know, that's just like a decision that you, that you have to make when you realize that the thing that you have in your head is not quite aligned with what everyone else, or what you know, the people that you actually want to serve have yeah. in mind. We talked about when we met as a Gmail PM. It's yeah. hard to hear. People right. Who have it doesn't usually. <laughs> yeah. But I understand it's the reality. Yeah. Um, Susan, I'm going to go back to you for a second. I think I didn't give you a chance to say what those learnings with those three students. How did it impact you? It, it was one of those teachable moments when you realize that, as well intentioned as you are, you really need to do more. And I know a lot more about uh, certificates and continuing education certification now than I did at this time last year. And I realized how important those kinds of relationships are where we can really pass these students to people who will help them um, get situated in a way where they can be successful. So it, it takes an investment. But um, some of the kids we worked with who I'm describing are coming back to work with us this summer. And I'm kind of really committed to making sure that they don't end up in this situation again. Thank you. Sure. And just a few more questions from me, and then I want to remind you, we're going to invite you guys to ask questions. It can be about the content of their work, their careers, why they do what they do, or even being a part of the Bay Area Impact Challenge, what that experience was like. Um, so be thinking. Um, Stefan, I'd like to go back to you and say, what can nonprofits learn from developers, and what can developers learn from nonprofits? Seems appropriate for this audience. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think when I look at it from, from the experience that we've had at Beyond 12, I think one of the things that um, we've been able to, to kind of impart on Beyond 12 is, is kind of what we maybe think of as developers on a day-to-day -day basis, which is this quantifiable uh, uh, and data-driven approach to problem solving, right? You know, something works or it doesn't, and it's valuable or it's not, and then you jettison or you double down, right? Um, and whereas in, in, at least in our case, and I think in the nonprofit sector in general, it's easy to kind of get focused on an individual or a community of individual and not think about how do you bring it to scale, how do you optimize, how do you kind of find ways to, to kind of 
provide the services and the help that you want to provide to a larger group of people that, that really need it. So I think that's something that, that we've been able to learn from the developer community at Beyond 12 and uh, vice versa. I think as I try to help Beyond 12 scale their services, uh, we talked about the coaching model and, and, and how we're trying to scale that through the My Coach application. Uh, you know, I do a lot of things to try to streamline and optimize and make sure that it, it kind of gets to as many people as possible. And it's easy in that process to make generalizations. It's easy to forget that behind all the things that you're working on, there's a real person. There's a young woman trying to go to college and trying to graduate and they're trying to navigate FAFSA applications and drop or add, add deadlines and so on and so forth, right? And you can't forget that as you, as you try your best to optimize and bring it to scale. You gotta remember that there's somebody who's, maybe even their entire family's hopes and dreams are on that person's shoulder and they're just trying to get through the next semester, right? Um, and so I come back to something that I think has been a recurring theme here, which is the, you know, technology is not enough, right? It's not just about the app, it's not just about the, the coach, or it's not, it, it, there's a human factor to all of these things that really have to be addressed and thought about and considered in everything that we do. Yeah, it's very impressive across all of your stories how deeply you guys have invested in understanding your users and the human element. So Eric, I'd love to ask you, how can developers be useful? If people are sitting here, they're inspired, they wanna get involved, how can they contribute their skills in the mm -hmm. current ecosystem? Yeah, and just to echo what Stefan just said about, uh, that, that, is, that goes with this, is that um, you know, apps are a dime a dozen. It's not, you know, it's like you can create an app, that's great. Um, but uh, this, to answer your question, we, um, you know, we see a lot of like hackathons and hack events, and I would say those are not useful in terms of creating systemic change. Um, and I think, Using, uh, think of it this way, you, know, you have a problem that you're trying to solve at work. Think about the hardest problem that you have at your job right now, you know, an intractable problem that, you, that, that will take you, you know, weeks, months, maybe years to solve. Um, and then having somebody come in and say, you know what, I'm gonna spend 24 and 48 hours on it, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna create an app and solve your problem and then walk away, right? Like, you just wouldn't take it that seriously. And I think that's sort of, that's what, sort of what goes on at hackathons when they're for social good, and I think the intention is there but the impact is not. And I think if you want to help as a developer, the best thing to do is plug into an existing organization that is doing something, uh, doing something that you respect and you admire and you think is a really important thing, and ask them how you can be helpful in, in helping them build an infrastructure that is sustainable and maintainable. The worst thing to do is create something and walk away, and no one's, no one's there to maintain it. So, yeah, Thanks, thanks for advice. sharing that insight. I think it's sure. unique since hacking, especially civic hacking events, are, are very hot. Um, Susan, the last question to you. Sane, how can developers be useful or get involved? Well, I'm actually a huge fan of civic hacking and a big admirer of organizations like Code for America. Um, and I think that there's an incredible need for developers to help with standardizing APIs and with pulling data out of government and a lot of different kinds of closed systems so that people can work with that. And, um, I agree with Eric, it's kind of a black box, and if you're moved to help in that direction, people will embrace you. But I also think that there's kind of an individual role that developers can play in organizations like Hack the Hood and probably all of these organizations. Um, we need people to be mentors. We need people who made the journey into tech and who love what they do to work with young people of color who have no idea what it's like to do those jobs what it's like to have that kind of passion, but who are really hungry to find something that they can do that's interesting and that's economically viable. So I would think about, you know, to what extent can you share yourself in a limited way with a demanding job by, you know, being a mentor, by giving a talk, by volunteering at an event, you know, find a way that you can share your passion and your experience uh, with somebody for whom you might end up being a giant influencer and help really um, move them forward into a new kind of career. Great, thank you. So I'd love to open it up for questions. There are microphones, Matthew's going over there. I see him, I called on him. But I really, this should be a conversation, so think of the hardest, toughest questions you wanna ask these panelists. Go, go for it. Hello, hi. First, uh, congratulations on winning the challenge. Um, my, my question is really one I struggle with a lot in the sector, which is the trade-off between scalability and impact on a personal level, a direct level. And I think it's something where um, 
I think technology tends to be tied up with scalability. The reason why we think the technology is a great way to enable to make more impact at scale, but it also sometimes is at odds with that person-to-person -person interaction and the immediacy of actually helping individuals. Like you say, sometimes you're doing something just to hack something out and make it happen and help them out versus some long-term sustainable, scalable uh, solution, which it sounds like the holy grail and often isn't uh, possible. How do you deal with that trade-off in, in, in your decision, in your process? And if you have a, you put yourself on a scale of one to 100, 100% 100 being, I'm 100% scale building. If it's not scalable, I don't touch it. And zero is all I care about is helping people. And you know, really, be honest, uh, the technology is very, very secondary, and or the scalability is really secondary to me. Anyone can answer. Sure, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab. I think uh, we, we struggle with scalability. I talked about the My Coach app and our coaching model, which is a very high touch model uh, that doesn't necessarily scale, right? And I think uh, Alex, our founder who's not here today, uh, we kind of bring parity to that question, right? I'm always challenging her to jettison things that is gonna not scale because it requires personal interaction or it requires a people heavy uh, organizational model, which is really hard to sustain when you get to scale. Um, so I challenge her on, are, you know, areas particularly necessarily need to be there. Can we do it in a different way? Can we support something with technology? Um, so I kind of bring that voice to the conversation and she brings the voice that I talked about earlier, which is, guess what? These kids come from a background where they don't have the support system. And a lot of times, um, I'll take a very specific example. We, ha we had a student that was trying to get to college and that student's parents was dissuading that person from going to college because she was gonna to be too far away from her family. It wasn't a financial issue, although that certainly was a struggle. It wasn't the fact that uh, they, they were concerned about her being able to, to be successful. It's like she was literally gonna to be too far away from her family. And these are the kids that we're trying to help, right? Uh, there are kids and they're falling through the gaps today. So it's a constant clash in, uh, I can't say that we found a solution, right? uh, but as, as technology uh, it becomes better, as it becomes more prevalent, as um, folks, uh, as kids are able to have, have access to devices, data plans that are affordable, et cetera, we can provide better services through technology. And, but the challenge, the, the tension between being technology-centric and human-centric is always there. We're super interested in that question because we want to scale from serving 20 kids in one summer program to 5,000 kids around the area. So it's, it's kind of the question we're grappling with. And I think there's no replacement for human relationships and human interaction. You can't just put somebody in front of a machine and think you're having the same quality of experience. But we're also talking about people who are doing everything on their phone, including watching videos. So we're very interested in the whole flip the classroom model, and the idea that we can supplement the real world interaction we do with more videos, and that things like Hangouts and Skyping can be supplements and good additions to real world exchange. So I think we're gonna very much look at how we can use those kinds of tools to do a better job of getting people ready and having to leave behind between the um, real world human touch programming that we do. Uh, the only thing I'd add is that um, I think, I don't necessarily think there's a tension, I think, at least in our organization, we sort of, we actually talk a lot about the spectrum of users. So we talk about people who are um, really high need, who really require a high touch personal interaction and, and maybe don't have a smartphone, don't have a computer, wouldn't, even, wouldn't be tech savvy if they had one. Um, and then the other side of the spectrum is a single mom working a minimum wage job, needs to find help, but knows what she's doing on her smartphone, right? So this is sort of the, the spectrum and, and you know, we, the ideal, the ideal member of One Degree is sort of like over here, but this part of the population, or this part of our sort of target market, if you will, is, 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 is one we can reach through intermediaries, like with personal touch and with social, with, through th social workers and social work professionals. And we, we very, very specifically say we, we don't, we're not, we're not a, uh, like an automated social worker. No one, we're never gonna replace social work. We're never gonna replace uh, a, a friend or a person who's gonna help, or, or a case manager. Um, so it's really, um, I think we're getting at that at two at different ways, not necessarily intention, at least in our case. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Question over here. Yeah, um, Eric, when you were talking about uh, the discovery you guys made of email itself being kind of an impediment to some of the people you were trying to serve, signing up and, and using your tools, 
Uh, it was kind of surprising to me. Um, you know, as, as you know, the, the organization I work with, we build tools to try to bring voting into the 21st century. Um, and we're ostensibly trying to build that for everyone. Um, but our, our sign up requires email. So mm -hmm. it occurred to me where we have that impediment to low income people using our tools. So mm -hmm. my question is, are, are any of you aware of good resources or organizations or whatever um, to kind of learn about things like that? Um, either like a sort of a list of, of things like that to keep in mind when you're building tools like this or even organizations that can come in and like audit the, the technology you're building to make sure that you're that it's accessible to low-income people I don't but if you if you find one let me know <laughs> I mean maybe we're I mean maybe this you know Does I th anyone? Well, can, can I hire you to come do that <laughs> yeah I think I mean I think I don't think that having someone from the outside come in and necessarily do an audit is going to solve the question of being user aligned. I mean, you have to, you have to, you know, obviously you know this, but um, just, just to make it clear, like you have to do that, that sort of interviewing and research uh, for yourself because it's going to be different for your product for our, than for ours. Um, so I think, um, you know, maybe in, um, yeah, maybe this is one case in which that would overlap, but there's going to be other stuff that is going to be really different, I think. But maybe one of the coolest things that could come out of this panel, you, you guys all get together afterwards and decide to put together yeah. a set of resources. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. You guys connect. Thank you for the question. Thanks. Question over here. Hi. Yeah, the first questioner had an interesting question about scalability of programs versus personal touch. And I run, a, a, a as a side project, a community nonprofit called the Obscure Organization at obscure.org. And we have one program that's kind of a public access Unix system that is kind of deliberately not scalable. You know, you have to ask nicely for an account or, you know, write a, write a letter on paper with a self-addressed stamped envelope. There's no online sign-up form. Because I can't, I can't maintain a 5,000 person, you know, online service in my spare time. But we had one other program that did end up scaling uh, where uh, I, I wrote and then conducted a series of classes on MIT Scratch for a local elementary school program, an after school program. And I wrote up the lesson plans for this and the classroom experience reports and published these under Wikipedia compatible licensing terms. And other parents in the community took those and ran other classes other schools in the community. And the, there were people in the uh, STEM wing of the local county public schools who took those lesson plans and used those as the basis for building you know, programs that they've taught for like the last five years, you know, as a supplementary program. So sometimes you can achieve scale by just figuring out a template for other people to, to do things and, you know, planting the seed of something like that. You know, it's an option. It, it, it's then because you, you have to have high touch in a lot of these things. You can't scale an after school program for 10 kids with one person. But you can, if you do it right, come up with ideas that will inspire other people to continue the work that you've done. So. Amazing. So just to make sure, that was an answer to Matthew's question. Just one. Perfect. I appreciate you sharing. That was really wonderful. Um, I think this will be our last question over here. Um, hi. I was actually curious for Beyond 12. You said you were feeding some of the data like on the students you track and stuff back to mm -hmm. the schools and stuff, trying to close that communication gap between the colleges and the education, like uh, primary education. Um, have you seen or have you guys been able to help drive policy change in public education a little bit? Have you seen schools changing their curriculums or programs or, or support structures to based on the information you've been providing them and the success stories that you've had or, or how, how's that going, I guess? Yeah, great question. So um, I guess the answer to that would be not yet. Um, so we're in year five as an organization. Our first cohort of students are about to graduate uh, and are graduating now. So um, for the high school systems that we have been working with for that period of time, we've been feeding this data back. Uh, one of the things that we don't have a ton of visibility into is how they're actually using that data and how they're consuming that. And by extension, what you're asking is, how are they taking that data and then using that to actually inform their, say, their curriculum and making changes, right? So uh, what, we're, what we're focused on right now is providing the tools for them to consume the data easily without having to uh, learn a lot about analytics or learn a lot about reporting and learn a lot about how, how to read, read the statistics, if you will. Um, and then the next stage is going to be, uh, hopefully, for us to also provide suggestions on where the areas that they could, where are the areas where they could improve, right? Uh, 
I, I kind of don't want to speak for, for Alex because this is really her, her area of expertise. I don't think we want to be in the business of telling uh, high schools how to make changes and what changes they should make. What we want to do is provide them with the data and help them understand the data and then let them draw their conclusions about what they need to do from a curriculum or process and, and model perspective. Great, I think as the moderator, I get to ask the last question and you guys can choose to all answer it or just one of you can answer it. But I think coming from the Google mindset, sometimes I'm obsessed with data and metrics and what's measurable in terms of our impact. But somebody really smart I met here yesterday said to me, not everything that counts can be counted. Not everything that counts can be counted. So I wonder if you guys will talk about how you think about your impact and does it need to be measurable? Yeah. I'll, I'll take a stab at it from, from the Beyond 12 perspective. I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is there are um, very difficult or, or areas that are non-quantifiable in our interactions with our kids that tells us, that are kind of markers and signals that tells us that maybe they're not doing that great. Maybe they're not able to find the support that need to be successful in college, for example, right? But they're non-quantifiable data. They're, they're not data points that show up on a report from a data feed, right? They're, they're conversational when our coaches talk to the kids and they're, you know, they're at home by themselves on a Friday night. That tells us that they haven't really created a community. They haven't kind of find, found that support system. These are non-quantifiable data points. We do our best to take those things and put it into our model that allows us to kind of figure out where, where kids are and what they're doing. But uh, like you said, not everything that counts can be counted. It's difficult. And that's one of the challenges that we're facing as we're trying to scale from a human high touch model to uh, a technology model. How do we catch those things? How do we make sure that those things are counted somehow? We don't think that the value of human experiences can all be measured, and we know how important that is. But we're actually very data-driven, because one of our axioms is, if you don't know how to measure it, you may not be ready to do it. I think that it's really true that you can think about how to measure or chart just about anything. So I hate the idea of being a lean organization and being busy, and feeling like you're doing, you're so busy, but what is the impact you're really having? So we think a lot about what's smart measurement and what are the measurements that we can measure that actually are viable. So one of our goals for next year is to have at least 50% of our youth, not only in education, but in some form of internship. And you know that's not 100%, but it's a good number. And I think it's really important to come up with uh, measurements that aren't only about what people did, but ways to measure the impact. How do you tell what the impact is? And that's where you get into that human experience or that values thing that you can't necessarily attach a hard number to, yet you have to find some, in my opinion, you have to find some equivalency or you run the risk that maybe you're just being busy and you're not actually doing everything you could. Uh, yeah, and I, I would just echo that. I mean, I think, uh, of course, we can't measure uh, the, the whole of human uh, experience, but um, for us, it's critical. We have to measure what we do, especially as a very new organization. We, we won't get a second chance to do it if we can't measure our results or our impact. Um, we have very limited funding, um, um, thankfully a bit more, thanks to Google, um, but uh, we, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're very new, and so we need to measure everything that we do, and if it doesn't, if, if anything that we're doing during the day doesn't uh, in some way affect our, um, the core metrics that, we're, that, we're, that we care about, then we, we, we usually don't do it. Um, not because it's not important, not because it wouldn't have some you know, ancillary benefit, but because um, as an organization, you also have to approach it with humility. We have one thing that we're gonna try to do really well, we're not gonna try to do all these other things really well too. Well, it's been my huge honor to sit up here with the best and brightest of the Bay Area nonprofits. I am, I think, allowed to say, give you guys a sneak peek, that we're going to be launching an impact challenge in Australia next week. We have one currently underway in the UK. Uh, the application's already closed, but voting will happen soon. And we hope to be able to bring them to many more places. And it'd be wonderful, amazing, if we saw some of your work in there someday, too. So thanks for being here, and enjoy the last few minutes of I.O.